Hello and happy Pi Day! So I found this interesting fact related to Pi from Fermaz Library on Twitter. If you're not following Fermaz Library, uh, go ahead, head over to Twitter and give them a follow. It's a great resource for interesting mathematical information. That if you choose two numbers at random, let's say 12 and 14, the probability that they have no common factor is given by 6 over pi squared. So like 12 and 14, they have a common factor. It is 2. Um, on the other hand, if you pick 15 and 29, uh, they do not have a common factor. Uh, and so, you know, basically, if you, if you do that enough times, this is the fraction of them that will have no common factor. You arrive at it through this summation, right? Because it's 1 over 1 squared, plus 1 over 2 squared, plus 1 over 3 squared, right? It's the probability that they have each of these factors in common. You do some probability math over here, and this is the answer you get. It turns out this sum uh, converges to, or the inverse of the sum, excuse me, converges to 6 over pi squared. What that means is this is a way of getting pi. By taking this probability fact, this probability experiment here of numbers not having uh, factors in common, we can end up with pi. Let me show you how that works. So I've set this up over here in Trinket. We'll go full screen over here. And the way I've set it up is we're going to loop over a large number of pairs. So we're going to be looping over, we'll start with 1,000 pairs of numbers. And we're going to pick two random integers, j and k, uh, that occur within a range. Um, so I've set the range between 10 and 10,000. Technically, we should go from 0 to infinity, but infinity is a little bit too big to reach, so we're going to go with 1,000 here. And we're going to start at 10 because so many of the numbers below that are prime or just squares or just factors of each other. I figured this would be a better net to cast. We just started about 10. We can lower that if we need to, but we're only missing nine numbers, right? It's probably more effective to make this one higher. So we pick these two random integers between n min and n max, j and k, and then we ask the question, do j and k have any common factors? So if they do have common factors, then we have found a pair that has a common factor. We're keeping track of that number of pairs with a common factor in this count in common. So in common, not uncommon, but in common, starts out at zero. And every time we draw a pair of numbers that have common factors, we add one to in common. And we'll talk about how we check for that in just a second. We'll get into the functions up above uh, in just a second. Um, so after we loop over uh, that uh, 1,000 pairs, um, we get to our final answer here. So our probability that we're interested in is the probability of drawing two numbers getting no common factors, right? So it was, so we're, we're checking it to see if they have common factors, but we actually want the reverse. So we just take one minus the probability that they have a common factor. So this is the probability that they have a common factor. So the probability they have no common factor is one minus this fraction right here. So what we should be getting, if you rearrange uh, the result from the tweet from Fermat's library, pi should be equal to the square root of 6 divided by that probability, right? Because the probability is 6 over pi squared, so you swap the probability in pi squared, take the square root, and you should get pi. Now, of course, this is an approximation, right? Because we are uh, using a very low value for infinity. We're also not trying too many pairs to start out with. Uh, but let's see how well this works. Let's click on run. And we end up with a pi of approximately 3.27, which is not too bad, right? I mean, it's within, you know, a few percent or so. Let's take a look at how this thing works under the hood here under factors.py. So first we're going to look at how do we determine if j and k have any factors. Well, we need to get the factors of j and k. So we're creating a list here called j factors and a list here called k factors. So this is the list of all the factors of j. This is the list of all the factors of k. Now we're going to ignore 1 as a factor because otherwise all numbers would have that factor in common. But we do need to include the number itself. So like for example if you're comparing 2 and 12 we need that 2 to be able to trigger that 2 and 12 have a common factor. And so what we do once we have those that list of factors, we, we loop over the, the numbers in j factors. So for each of j's factors in j factors, we're going to check for if this number is in k factors. So this is if they have one in common. We only need one in common. We don't need to know how many they have in common. But as soon as they have one, we leave this routine because we don't need to check anymore. And we return the value true. If we make it out of this loop, it means that they didn't have any in common, so we can return false. 
And so the only piece left is getting the factors themselves. So that's what we're doing up here in the function get factor. So we put in a number, J and K. Uh, we start out with a blank list because we need to be returning a list, right? So down here, we're assuming that we're gonna get a list out. So we're starting with a blank list and they're going for F in the range from two to M plus one. We're starting at it two because there's no point in checking one. Everybody has a factor of one. We're going to M plus one so that it will include M because Python's range function for whatever reason stops just shy of the second value. I'm still not sure how I feel about that, but I go along with it for the sake of the Python community. So we need to check whether f is a factor of the number m here. So we take m and divide it by f, right? So if f is a factor of m, this thing should be an integer, shouldn't have any decimals trailing. That means it should be equal to the integer version of itself, right? Meaning I shouldn't have any decimals left over. And so if that's the case, if this does work out, then that means this is a factor. We append it to the list. We keep looping around all those numbers. So we are re we return a list of factors. So that means each one of these lists will have at least one number in it. It's at least going to have the number M because M is a factor of itself always, right? And so you can run this several times if you want. This number will turn up differently every time because it's drawing random numbers every time a different set of random numbers. This time we got pi equals 3.11 if you're round, which is a lot better. So you can get closer farther away depending on which numbers it draws. We can also improve this result if we increase the number of pairs. So let's go from 1,000 to 3,000. Of course, now it's going to take three times as long to run. And there we got 3.15, which is even better. So if you increase this, or if you increase this range, you'll end up with a better estimate for pi. And the, one of the reasons I love calculating pi in a way like this is there's no circles involved in here. Well, there's probably a hidden circle somewhere. You can always map things on circles, but we haven't done anything with circles. We haven't done anything with radiuses or areas or circumferences. We haven't even used any trig functions. We're literally working with numbers. We're just drawing random numbers. And in a sense, we're ultimately working with prime numbers because ultimately all those factors break down into prime factors. So it's kind of cool. This is a pretty neat way of, of approximating pi and connecting pi to all the other stuff that goes on in number theory. So anyway, I hope this is uh, of interest to you. Uh, feel free to play around with this, see how well you can get your pi should be to match pi. And as always, a happy pi day to you. I will see you next time. Bye-bye.